morning we've created a bit more time to do some sharing, a little bit of sharing about some things, where we, some things about where we're going, some things about where we are, some things that give a bit more space to do it. Um, and so uh, we're going to do that in a second. But just to say we are really grateful for the whole church. Everything we do, who we are matters, all the different contributions. We are a body, a family, a whole church where every generation matters, not just one particular group or part of it. We want to see everybody flourish in God. And, and that's really important, and, that, and that's kind of underpinned so much of what it means to shine brightly in a culture where family is difficult. Actually, the kind of challenges around relationships, um, we want to see the life of God flowing out of us and outward into the world. And actually, I was reminded this morning as I was praying, I was somewhere else doing one of the early services this morning, and um, I was reminded of this morning as I woke up that Actually, God has given us a lot. He's entrusted us with a lot. You may not feel that this morning. You may not feel when you look at your life, you may feel, actually, I hold virtually nothing. But I know some of the things God has given me, and I also know a lot about us. And actually, God has given us a lot, and he wants to bless us and use us to multiply what he's given us. It's not a static thing, and he can use all of us. In his hands, he can use all of us. There's no super people in God's kingdom. They're simply followers of Jesus, doing what he's called us to do. And we want to celebrate that and give thanks for that. And we're going to start with just with a bit of things around life groups. Dan's going to start, I think, has just done something around life groups, which meet during the day. Um, you're just going to share a bit of then. Then we're going to go on to Susie. Susie's going to share. I mean, Brownie, sorry, is going to share. Morning everyone, so I'm uh, Dan Darwin, if I haven't met you, hello, nice to meet you. Um, I'm here to speak about um, life groups. So first of all, what is a life group? What is the purpose of them? Um, so there any group that is meeting basically outside of this context, okay, that is part of the church. They're an opportunity midweek, either during the day or in the evening, to get to know people on a deeper level, to encourage and uh, uh, pray for people, to read the Bible to, together. Um, and to journey together, to be disciples together. Um, can I really encourage you, if you're part of this family, we talked about the electoral uh, role, about that being a way of saying you're part of this family. Can I really encourage you, if you're part of this family, if you um, call this place home, can I really encourage you to find a place outside of our corporate Sunday mornings or Sunday evenings? Can I really encourage you to find a group of people to sit and pray with, to read scripture with, to encourage uh, each other? Um, I think it's really, really important. And may I humbly suggest to you, and this isn't flippant, I can, may I humbly suggest to you that if you think you're too busy for, for a life group, if you think you're too busy for that relationship, can I, can I humbly suggest to you that you're the exact kind of person who needs one? I really mean that. Not just because of what you can receive. You might think, oh, I, 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 don't, I don't need a life group. You know, I'm quite self-sustaining or I've got people praying for me. Can I suggest the reason you need to be part of a life group? Is so you can give? Is it so you can bless? So that you can encourage? So that you can be part of someone else's team? It, it, and you'll be amazed that in the, in the giving out, how much you receive as well so so important um, so that's what a that's what a life group is now that there's a lot of different types of life group that we run in our church so some of them might be organized by geographic location for instance some of them might be organized by age and stage of life or they might be organized just simply by the time um, that they meet and the availabilities of the people so there are lots of different groups at lots of different times in lots of different places with slightly different focuses so if this is at all something on your radar, please do come and talk to myself or Tim. It would, the best time to join a life group is now. Um, if, you, if you think, oh, I'm going to need a bit of time to process that and, and think about that, um, I just want to uh, kind of um, advise you of something that's happening in the medium term. In, in May, we're going to be pausing life groups for a brief uh, window of about a month or so. All the life groups will kind of not press stop, don't worry, press pause. Um, and as a church, together, we will run for a short period of time, about four or five weeks, we will run a number of different um, groups organized by different types of activity. 
Okay? It's an opportunity for people to break out of their individual life group, to build relationship, to meet some different people, to meet at some different times, try a different pattern of life. Can I suggest if now isn't the best time for you to join a life group, can I suggest that using those four or five weeks as a trial period with a different group, a new group that's been formed specifically for that purpose for a specific period of time might be a great opportunity to just dip your, your toe in the water. Um, and then if, if you've dipped your toe in the water there, it'd be great then when life groups start back up in the June um, in the, in, you know, that you would say, ah, you know what, I really want to get into a group now. Um, so, short term, join a life group now. Medium term, try one in May. Long term, join one in June. Okay, so there are your options. Okay. Um, on the, uh, on, just on that idea of the medium term, the, the kind of in, in May, um, the summer series as we're calling it, if you've got specific ideas, if you know someone in your life group or, or that you know around the church who has some specific skill or gifting, maybe they've got a teaching they've got on their heart, maybe they've got a social activity they think that would be great to build community, then again, do come and talk to me and Tim about that as well. And we'll be announcing the program for that at the end of next month. Thanks so much, Dan. That's great. Um, Brani, I do apologize for calling you Susie twice. I am very sorry. Setting a terrible example. Can I have your forgiveness? I suppose so. Great. Thank you. Um, hello, everybody. Um, if you don't know, I'm Bryony. I am the ops manager here. It's a very grand way of saying I look after the office and I look after the building with lots of help. And um, today I thought I would talk to you just a little bit about what happens in the building when we're not here on a Sunday, because I know from past experience of being me that you can come on a Sunday and think that's kind of the only thing that happens here, but far from it. Our building is very busy. We're very blessed to have such an amazing building. So um, I'm just going to share a little bit of what we do here in the week and what you weren't, what's happening when you weren't looking. Um, so first off, we have two choirs that meet here every week. They practice here every week, rehearse. Um, we have Clarity Choir on the top and Songways Choir on the bottom, where we have some church members in there, if you can spot them. Um, so that's every Tuesday and Wednesday. We have those in there. Next slide, please. Um, once a month we have Music for Miniatures, which is Tim's favourite thing ever, which is where um, a wonderful lady called Julie comes in and she brings in amazing, talented musicians and it's aimed at preschool children and it's a chance for them to get out really close with classical music and experience something new. And I think it's fair to say that Julie is one of the most joyful people that ever could enter this building. She absolutely loves coming here and the room is packed. It's a wonderful way to get new people into the building. Okay. Concerts. I have can tell you that last year we had 14 concerts in the building, usually on a Friday or a Saturday evening. Um, they're quite varied. We get a lot of choirs. Um, but we have also had um, some extremely high-end uh, classical quartets, etc., which would come through us through the Bath Festival, who do lots of things with us. Um, in the middle, we had kind of an amazing group, for, which I think is parents and teachers from one of the local secondary schools. It, it, it was loud and it was lively and I was getting a little anxious, Janet will appreciate, as we got towards the curfew of loud music. But it was, it was amazing. The building was kind of moving. Um, and in the bottom was a really fun kind of choir which came as part of Party in the City, which we do every year. Party in the City is a free event in Bath where um, lots of venues open up to allow all sorts of people to come and perform and it's kind of like a, a little mini festival, you wander in and out. And they were quite fun, a bit different. Okay, next one, please. Uh, we have a variety of workshops. Some you might expect, like a, a choir workshop, and um, I think this was a, another choral thing, and some more unexpected, like a handstand workshop, um, run by another Bryony, which I appreciate. And uh, as you can see, I think she said that lady there was 75 doing that handstand. So that was something a little bit different. Um, and we had six different workshops here last year. Um, next one, please. 
Book signings, we have a lot of book signings. Toppings and Mr. B's both come here regularly. Um, we have some fairly well-known people. Claire Baldwin was here just before Christmas. Rick Stein, building was packed, standing room only. And uh, thankfully he didn't cook. Someone suggested he might, but we decided against that. And uh, just on Friday night, we had Bethany Hughes, um, a, who's a historical presenter from the television, who was amazing, really, really interesting. So they come here all the time, and they love the space. And it's, this is an example, I think, of where we sometimes get groups of people who you just would never otherwise get in the building if you get kind of a slightly a book that appeals to kind of a, a kind of, I say, different audience, but an audience we perhaps wouldn't always expect. And people come in here, they never fail to be wowed by the building, and I think... You know, just having those people come into the building happily and to see that it's not a scary place is an amazing blessing that we can offer. Um, so I think last year we had 10 book signings. Um, yeah, sorry, thank you. Um, and then we use it for a massive variety of community things. So we did Waffles on Walcott, which I'm sure some of you are familiar with and were involved with, which was part of the Warm Spaces initiative last winter, where we, I think it was Tuesdays, downstairs in the crypt, we served waffles. And that was amazing because we did it in partnership with some other churches, which is always lovely. Um, so that was great. We are sometimes a polling station. We do Heritage Open Days, which are a chance for people who are really interested in the history of the building to come in and look. So we'd have the building open for, I think it's May, two or three days. The Gen Genesis Summer Barbecue was here in the garden, and they have already booked for next summer. So that was a wonderful blessing we could offer. Um, we have lots of people come do historical research, including all the way from North America, the Jane Austen Society, um, who come every year two or three times a year to look at the building. And, of course, we hold our St Andrew's School services at Easter and Christmas and their leaving service. Again, it's, it's a different audience who may or may not have ever been here before. Uh, we have some other things which are maybe a bit more church-run. We have toddlers once a week run by Susie, which is going really well, a real blessing, and a really faithful crowd who come every week, and wonderful volunteers who help. We have a youth group on a Friday night, we had a new discipleship group which formed out of one of the Alpha courses we ran last year, and we have another life group, as Sam was talking about, who meets here every week. Um, we had two weddings, Joe and Sab, <laughs> and Yen and Hannah, um, which were both oh, beautiful occasions, of course. Um, we had Men Behaving Dadly, which was our dad's group, which has now morphing into a new group run by someone in the community who's approached us who wants to run a dad's group here, which is great, so that's just starting up. And of course, we have our amazing cafe run by um, Carolina and Hanukkah, which is just, I think, such an amazing thing to have. Just the building is open, the building is alive. You come in every day, it's buzzing, there's different people, and it makes for people who have worked here in the week when we didn't have the cafe in the building can feel a little bit quiet and a little bit empty. Just using the space we've been given is such an amazing blessing and so important. I think that's it. So, yeah, hopefully that's given you an, a kind of an idea of what happens here and shown you that the building is it's thriving. Obviously, we can always do more, but it is in use, and it's, it's really a hugely important part of our mission as a church to use the building that we have been gifted with, which is why it is also very important to maintain it and improve it. <laughs> Brian, thank you. Give Brian a little round of applause. That would be great to kind of... <laughs> oh, yeah. <clears throat> Brilliant. Thank you. Thanks, Bray. And uh, Sheila, thank you so much for your prayers. Um, to be fair, anyone who is... Uh, going to speak about um, church finances uh, needs prayer cover and I need prayer cover as well because my presentation seems to have decided not to open yeah interesting oh yes there we go good an answer to prayer <laughs> uh, so um, I've been given the uh, 
given the, uh, the task, as it were, of talking about that subject that we all love to talk about in the church, which is kind of money, finances. Um, but actually, it's a really important area, and uh, I'm going to suggest to you that it's a really exciting area, which um, you may uh, struggle to accept, but hopefully will, you know, when we look at it a bit more deeply. Um, so I'm really here to give you a brief update on the church's financial and investment strategy uh, following on from what we set out in the Vision Sunday last year. And I want to just start, um, I just want to invite you to take a good look around the space that you're sitting in. Just have a look at it and just the feel of the place and the beauty of the place. Let's take a couple of minutes just or a couple of seconds just to appreciate that. And then I'd like to you to have a look at a picture, if Catherine, if I could have that. It's a bit difficult to see, but that is a picture of what this place looked like uh, about 20 years ago. And without being disrespectful, it was dark, dismal, and frankly, pretty horrible. And I'd like you just to have a picture, think about what the crypt looks like now, that space, and then have a look at the photograph, if I can have the next one of what it looked like before. And it was basically pretty grim. My kids wouldn't go into it um, because it just was not a very nice and welcoming place. And I just want to kind of remember, as we have done you know, a number of times before, but that transformation, the transformation in this building came about because God made it clear that it was his will that it should happen. And that was despite some initial opposition, and I have to confess that I was one of the people who was dead set against it at the time. Uh, and a congregation that was smaller than our average congregation today responded in faith. Now, the refurbishment to the whole building cost over a million quid then, which in today's terms is about 1.7 million pounds. And that is just amazing. And it shows that our God is a God of lavish abundance. And then he can do amazing things when we are obedient to his call. Fantastic to hear from Brian, all the wonderful things that are happening in this church throughout the week. You know, all of which are part of our wider ministry to bring the love of Jesus into the heart of our community. And you know, the church building is a key tool in that ministry. So we need to be good stewards of the resource that God has given us. And I believe that his main purposes for why the refurbishment was allowed to happen are actually only now beginning to be seen. And there is so much more to come. I've spent a good few years of my life project managing this refurbishment in the planning process and implementation and so forth. And you know, I am so excited to see what is happening and what God has planned for us. But of course, there's a financial cost to our stewardship. And on Vision Sunday last year, we indicated that the church was operating at an, a deficit of approximately 60,000 pounds per annum in terms of day-to-day -day running costs. And that was mainly due to the fact that the PCC decided to step out in, in faith you know, and to fund several new ministries, which were originally resourced, uh, or initially resourced by making use of reserves. But, you know, that's clearly not sustainable, and, you know, nor did the PCC believe it's right to continue to use the legacy just be, being bequeathed to us by previous generations to continue to fund day-to-day -day costs, because, bluntly, that's our responsibility. And so we set out a strategy to, in faith, um, achieve a balanced budget by the end of 2025, which entails reducing the deficit incrementally by £20,000 each year, over three years. And I'm pleased, but not surprised, to report that we achieved that, the first stage of that target last year, and we're looking to do the same this year and next. And just to put that in context, achieving a balanced budget would require an increase in giving of about £15 a month, based on 100 regular donors. In Malachi chapter 3, God commands us to bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. Now, I don't want to go into a lot of detailed deliberation about what that means and how much the tithe should be 
all of those things, we, we could do it another time, but I take it to mean that God commands us to return, and that's the key word, to return, because it's his, not ours, to him, the first fruits of everything, including the money he has blessed us with. And the storehouse I take to be the place where you are fed spiritually, which, as we've heard previously, if you know, this is your home, this is your church, then this is where you are fed spiritually. Now, in the rest of the Bible, we are repeatedly told not to test God. But in Malachi, we are specifically told to test him. And he says this, test me in this and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have room enough for it. Wow. I don't know about you, but I, I want that blessing, and, and I want it for us as a church. So my suggestion is how about we put God to the test as he commands? I believe that honoring the tithe is essential to releasing God's blessing in our lives, and no one will ever be poorer for doing that. And what we return to God, he uses, he sows into ministry, and he multiplies, and he multiplies, and he multiplies. You know, I can testify to the fact that honoring the tithe will not make you poor. I can testify that in my life, and I'm sure many others can here as well. And it's also something that we as a church seek to honor by sowing part of the money that we receive into the ministries of the mission partners that God has called us to support, and that's hugely important. And if you want to know more about tithing, go into it more deeply, please have a chat with me or Tim afterwards, um, and you can find information about how to give on our website or have a chat with me or David, our treasurer at the back. I'd also like to say that we can honor God, not just with our money, but also with our time. You know, as we've been hearing, as Bryce shared, there are so many things happening here during the week and on Sundays, you know, where there are opportunities to get involved. So again, have a chat with her, me, Tim, find out more. So just moving on briefly, if I may, the PCC has been considering the best way to use the blessing, and it is a huge blessing of our reserves, to resource ministry and I'd like to briefly just set out what's been decided for you at, which was decided at the last PCC meeting last year in November. Now, we had to consider the appropriate level of reserves to maintain going forward in the context of charity commission recommendations. We concluded that £60,000, which roughly represents three months of day-to-day -day expenditure for the church, is an appropriate balance between prudence and faith which leaves us with a balance of about £100,000 to invest. Now, inevitably, with the building of this size and age, there are always challenges to do with maintaining everything in good order, as against undertaking new projects. And so the PCC has spent quite a lot of time just considering that, and we've sought to achieve a kind of a reasonable balance between those aspects. And Catherine, if you wouldn't mind putting up... Um, well, clear as mud. <laughs> um, look, I don't propose to go through this in minute detail now because, you know, that would not be a good use of time, I don't think. But for those of you who are interested, um, there's a detailed summary. It's about four pages. Uh, there are copies of that on the back table there. Uh, I think it's very important that we are transparent uh, and accountable for finances, for how we are investing and spending that money. So please take away a copy, or if you want me to email a copy, just let me know, and I'll be very happy to answer any questions that you know, come from that. Uh, the two, th two specific things I'd just like to draw your attention to, firstly, is that we're going to replace the floor in the crypt, which is looking decidedly tired. Uh, we're going to replace it with a hard-varying um, LVT, I think, a luxury vinyl tile. Uh, we're just in the process of getting detailed quotes for that, and the intention is that we will take up the floor tiles ourselves in order to save money, uh, and we also plan, Brownie would like um, to redecorate at the same time. So there will be some opportunities for volunteer involvement in this. Watch this space, we'll keep you posted. The second thing I'd just like to briefly say is that um, we are applying, uh, in fact we have applied, but um, for faculty approval, which is what the ecclesiastical planning consent is called, 
for a new servery area in the back corner where, um, to replace the desk where the coffee is served. There are some plans pasted at the back on the notice board there. Uh, there is a form there as well as to who you, if you wish to object, you can, um, you can do so. Um, we've had a positive pre-application response from the diocesan advisory committee, and so we're going to go out for tender for prices on that in due course. And the PCC has decided that actually the whole cost of that shouldn't be met from reserves, so we will actually be coming back to the fellowship in due course to, to invite you to contribute to that, but we won't do that until we have the approval. I should also just say that our five-year inspection, the quinquennial, as it's called um, by the church architect, is due this year, which may throw up some more requirements, but we're in regular contact with him, so we hope to avoid any particular nasties that uh, come out of the woodwork. Decoration of the windows on the south side of the building will be done later this year and will carry on for the remainder of the building in the years ahead. Finally, and this is a miracle, we've had the go-ahead from the insurers and we've also had the money to uh, replace the lead on the vestry roof that was stolen last year. So Emery's are going to be starting that work a week tomorrow. You'll see scaffolding going up there. Uh, that's basically what I want to say. If, if anyone has any particular questions now, I'll be happy to answer them. Uh, otherwise, you know, when you've had a chance to read through the document, please just grab me, send me an email, whatever. If there aren't any questions, I'll go and sit down. Can we give Alistair a round of applause to, to kind of just say thank you to him? Thank, thank you for the courage of kind of taking that on and doing that and laying it out as well. Um, there's always the opportunity to have a conversation with one of us to kind of work out where we're going or how we take it forward. Um, actually, I have still got a little bit of time to preach, so that's all right. Uh, but, but actually, the other thing I want to say, as part of the PCC agreed this week as well, is over um, the last two or three years, I've been mulling over um, the kind of shape of my life, and I hope that you do that too, about how you find life and where you are with that. And so generally, after you've done 10 years ministry, um, you're encouraged to be an Anglican, that you're entitled to a sabbatical, uh, which is essentially sort of three months, um, maybe a little bit more than that, to have some time off, to be renewed, to be refreshed. We've been thinking about that for the last two or three years, done 12 years in ministry, and essentially, when we're away on the holiday uh, this summer... Um, you don't have to go on holiday to Spain to hear God, but it's in this instance it did help, um, is that actually went from kind of, I'd like to do this, do I need to do this? And, and I had a re deal, deep sense that I needed to take some time out, find renewal, um, and there's loads of things I'd love to do. And also our kids are both at the stage where Hannah will have finished GCSEs and Joshua uh, will have, before he's gone to university, and so there's an opportunity. And so I came back, chatted to the archdeacon, the bishop, chatted to the wardens who were very generous. All of them have been very generous, saying, yeah, please, just go. And no, they didn't quite say that in the PCC. And so for me, it is an opportunity to seek God, to take some time. And so I'm really grateful for the opportunity to do that and to be renewed as well. We've got a great team. It is a team game. It's not about one person. And actually, if you sit here this morning on the basis of anything that's been shared and think, do you know, I've got a burning sense that I'm called to do something. We'd love you to say, we'd love you to join in, we'd love you to find your place. This isn't about waiting for one person to do some magic. It's about the people of God living the life of the Spirit, period. <laughs>